Good morning, afternoon, or evening. Dr. Richardson here, lecture 21. We're almost finished, and this is the last of our human physiology lectures, and today we get to talk about sex. So, we have a reproductive system, and it has two main jobs. The first is to make gametes. Gametes are our sex cell sperm for men, eggs for ladies. But the other job of the reproductive system is to ensure the survival of a genetically diverse species. We talked in lecture nine about meiosis and how meiosis is the creation of sperm and egg and all the shuffling of the genes that happens when meiosis occurs and the goal of meiosis and therefore of the reproductive system is to make sure we have uh, offspring that are genetically different from us because that diversity is the stuff from which evolution happens. Now, in the reproductive system, we have hormones from the brain that will target the testes and ovaries to make the gametes, to do the meiosis, and there are sex organs that also make other hormones that target the body and result in secondary sex characteristics, breasts, hips in women, and the deep voice and the facial hair in men. So hormones make, uh, brains make the hormones, but then sex organs make different hormones. And we're going to talk about those today. And you can see our table here where we're going. All of the party starts at puberty. Puberty is that moment that comes for every human somewhere between the age of 8 and 15. For me, it was around 11. Uh, the pituitary gland says, hey, it's time, and starts releasing into the blood LH and FSH. Now, these names should not be um, new to you because in uh, lecture 19, when we talked about the endocrine system, we learned that the pituitary gland releases LH and FSH. We also learned in lecture 19 that the target cells for these hormones, where these hormones go, where the message is caught is in men, the Leydig cells in the testes, and in women, the target is follicular cells in the ovary. And starting with our picture over here, you see pituitary gland releasing LH and FSH. We now know those are called luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And these hormones are released by the pituitary into the blood, flow through the blood. They reach the testes in men or the ovaries in women. And you see here the target. And for men, the target is the Leydig cells in the testes. And then we're going to look at their actions and what they do. In men, the release of LH and FSH results in the Leydig cells making testosterone. Testosterone is a hormone. Women have a little bit of it. Men have most of it. And testosterone does two things. It's going to control spermatogenesis, making of sperm the meiosis in men that makes the sperm, but the testosterone will also stimulate secondary sex characteristics, genitals in large, pubic hair, underarm hair, facial hair in men, and the voice gets deeper. Those are all the results of testosterone, which is made in the Leydig cells as a result of the release of LH and FSH. And in men, this happens all lifelong, whole lifelong. In women, we're always more complicated. 
Uh, the LH, the target is the ovaries, and the LH causes ovulation. Us women, at least before we got menopause, uh, like I just recently did, but women for many, many years will ovulate, release one egg from their ovary each month in preparation for maybe getting pregnant, and the LH causes the ovulation. The FSH causes the ovaries to make estrogen, and estrogen does three important things. One, it controls oogenesis, or making eggs in women, the meiosis that makes the eggs. Also, estrogen thickens the uterus lining each month. So that's when we have our period. What comes out is the blood that's the lining of the uterus. And every month it will thicken up, hoping it's going to get a baby. And when it doesn't, we have our period. And thirdly, estrogen causes the secondary sex characteristics in women, breast enlargement, wider hips, and pubic and underarm hair. So estrogen does three things please know what they are. Now, let's talk about male anatomy for a moment. Uh, we have the penis, of course. We have the testes, two of them. You see one in the picture because the gentleman is cut down the middle so you only can see one testicle. <coughs> and inside of the testicles, are the seminiferous tubules, and that's where sperm is made. We'll get back to that in a minute. We also have the epididymis. That is a storage spot for the sperm that is made. Sperm is made here. It's stored in the epididymis. Then we have the vas deferens. That is a tube that connects the epididymis to the urethra. So when a man ejaculates, sperm will move up through the vas deferens and then through the urethra and out through the penis. We have the seminal vesicle and the prostate gland. What they do is they give semen to the sperm and then the urethra is the passageway out of the body in the male for both urine and sperm bathed in semen. Now let's zoom in a bit and talk about the testes and this seminiferous tubules. So these are coiled tubes that are packed inside of each testicle. So if we took a testicle and cut it open, we would see all these kind of coiled tubes. And if we took one of those and we cut it open, here is the seminiferous tubule. There's a hole, we call it a lumen, a hole in the middle. And the lumen takes the sperm that is made and takes it to the storage spot, the epididymis. All right, let's zoom in a little bit more. Now you can see in this picture a complete seminiferous tubule. It's cut down the middle. Now, there are two types of cells, two types of cells in the seminiferous tubule. There are Leydig cells, and there are Sertoli cells. Now, the Leydig cells are out here, these dark pink, and they technically lie outside of the tubule itself. So, Leydig cells make testosterone, they catch the LH and the FSH message, and they will make testosterone. The Sertoli cells are these purple cells inside the seminiferous tubule, and they are like nannies. They feed the sperm. Safe place for sperm to grow up and develop. So they're like nannies. And the Sertoli cells are inside the tubule. The Leydig cells are outside 
the tube. As I said, sperm doesn't just come out by itself. Sperm has a protective fluid called semen. And when a man ejaculates, about 300 million sperm will leave his body, but it's bathed in a fluid called semen, nourishing fluid that protects the sperm. Sperm have to leave through the urethra. There could be traces of urine in there. They could burn up and kill that sperm. Sperm has to go up in the vagina and travel up. Very acidic place, harsh conditions. So the sperm is bathed in this semen, this fluid that helps protect it from the harsh environment and gives it food. The semen is, comes from seminal vesicle right here and from prostate here. So as the sperm is traveling up through the vas deferens, uh, seminal vesicle gives it some fluid, prostate gives it some fluid, now it's ready and it will come out through the penis. And that is how it works. Now, let's finally talk about the making of sperm. That is called spermatogenesis. Genesis is making or creating sperm. So let me, I have a picture here, and let me orient you to this. We are in the a testes. Here is our seminiferous tubule. You can't see the whole tube. You just see part of it. Here's the lumen, the hole that's in the middle of the tubule. Uh, here are the, it's a Leydig cell. Remember, as I said, those are outside the seminiferous tubule. And then here's the Sertoli cells, the nannies inside of the tubule. And here is where we start. Now, a spermatogonia is a diploid, has homologous pairs. Remember, diploid has both of chromosome 1, both of chromosome 2, both of chromosome 3, etc., down to number 23. All daddy's chromosomes, nothing from mommy yet. Here's what's going to happen. Spermatogonia is going to do mitosis. Mitosis, remember, is you make an exact copy of yourself. The daughter cells that result from this round of mitosis, the daughter cells, one of them will become a primary, one with a little zero elevated above, primary spermatocyte. So we go from spermatogonia diploid cell to primary spermatocyte. Now, one of them is going to go into action and do meiosis. The other one, though, is going to be saved. Remember, a man makes sperm for 70, 80 years. So we got to have some cells we're going to save to make sperm later. So one more time, spermatogonia do mitosis, one of them becomes a primary spermatocyte, and then primary spermatocyte will do meiosis one, first round of cell division. And the daughter cells we get are called secondary spermatocytes. We're at the end of meiosis one, secondary spermatocyte. Now, the secondary spermatocytes will do meiosis two, and the daughter cells that result, four of them now, are called spermatids. These are immature sperm. They're not ready to swim yet. Then the spermatids will do some changes within themselves, and they will become eventually mature sperm. Notice how the spermatogenesis occurs in a directional way, moving from the outside of the tubule toward the lumen. By the time we have mature sperm, they're right at the lumen, right at the tunnel they're going to take to go hang out in the epididymis. And there we have spermatogenesis 
making sperm. One more picture for you. We're in the testes. Spermatogonia does meiosis. You only see one of the daughters, the primary spermatocyte. We then have meiosis one. We have secondary spermatocytes. Meiosis two. We have spermatids, and they will develop into, it says normal, but we say mature sperm. Keep in mind, as the sperm develop, they're moving toward the lumen. So from the outer edge of the seminiferous tubule, and the divisions happen moving towards the lumen. And here's your final almost mature sperm. Once in the lumen, sperm go to epididymis and hang out until ejaculation, until the man releases his sperm. Here's just a picture of a mature sperm. There's the head. Here's that tail. It's a flagella. You might remember all the way back to lecture four. And see these yellow things? That's mitochondria. Mitochondria is where ATP is made. ATP is energy. Those spermies need to swim, so they need a lot of ATP. And this green thing here, very interesting. It's uh, like a recognition membrane. When the sperm meets with an egg, the, there's uh, chemicals in this green area that will mix with the egg, and it'll be like, are you human? I'm human? Okay, great. Now we will meet and be fertilized. So there's your mature sperm. All right. Men are pretty easy. Women are, as usual, more complicated. Uh, so let's talk about female anatomy. Females have two ovaries. There it is, blown up. Two ovaries. Here's our uterus. We have these fallopian tubes that connect ovary to uterus. And then the bottom part of the uterus is called the cervix. That's where uh, women can develop cervical cancer. Sometimes they have to cut part of that out. And then there's the vagina and uh, the opening to the outside. So ovaries, uterus, fallopian tubes, cervix, and vagina, the female parts. Now. Making eggs is complicated. We call it oogenesis or oogenesis. Doesn't matter, but it's making eggs. Now, the interesting thing about females is we start making eggs before we are born. So, my parents had sex my mom got pregnant and by the time I was six weeks old in her uterus, my body started making eggs. Amazing, right? Amazing. And then what happens is meiosis stops, just stops. And all of the eggs are frozen in meiosis and then I'm born, I grow up as a little girl, I hit my puberty, I start having my period, and then the party starts back up again. So, let's start with oogonia. We start with spermatogonia, we start with oogonia in females. It is the parent cell, it's a diploid cell, it's from which all eggs come from. And the oogonia, just like the spermatogonia, will first do mitosis. <clears throat> I didn't show it here because this picture is more complex, but the oogonia will do mitosis, and then we will have primary oocytes, the daughter cells, primary oocytes, just like with the sperm. The names change as the process happens. Now, these primary oocytes will turn into these primordial follicles 
meaning it's the oocyte and these follicular cells begin to grow around it. And then these primordial follicles will start meiosis one, start meiosis one, but then they freeze, they stop. Now, can you imagine your chromosomes, ladies, in your eggs being frozen, frozen, about to divide, but being frozen right there, being held, frozen for years and years and years until you, you know, start your period. So they're just hanging out. Uh, all primary oocytes stop meiosis at prophase one. Female is born with oocytes in the middle of meiosis. And then she's born eight to 15 years later, she starts puberty. Now, FSH and LH will start being released from the brain every 28 days in a cycle. And this cycle prepares the female body every month, getting an egg ready in case the female will reproduce. If she doesn't reproduce, if she doesn't get pregnant, she will have menstruation and the egg will not be fertilized and the egg comes out in the blood from the menstruation. Let's take a look at pictures. So we start here, oogonia right there. 2N means it's a diploid cell. Both chromosome number one, number two, number three, all the way down to number 23. All mommy's chromosomes, nothing from daddy yet. We do mitosis first. We have these primary oocytes. You could also call them primordial follicles, whatever. They will stop, arrests, stops in prophase one before the baby was even born. She gets born. She's a little girl. She grows up. She has her puberty. She starts having her period. And then every month, we pick it back up. So here's what happens now. We're at puberty. I'm now, what, 12, 13, 14. I'm a teenager, but I'm getting my period. What's happening in my body? Well, each month, one of these primordial follicles will restart meiosis. Which one? How many? We don't really know. We, th we think there might be more than one, but eventually only one egg will be released in ovulation. But one of them, or maybe more, will restart meiosis. The daughter cells at the end of meiosis one are called secondary oocytes. What's interesting is that only one of the daughter cells will continue. The other one becomes something called a polar body that we get rid of. We don't use it. So let's focus over here. Secondary oocyte now is growing. You see these follicular cells are growing, growing, growing around the egg. And what happens is these follicular cells surrounding the oocyte release estrogen because they're getting LH and FSH. The funny thing about it is that when the follicular cells start secreting estrogen, there's a feedback that happens and the estrogen released flows back up to the brain and says, hey, you need to release more LH and FSH. And it's the second burst of LH that will cause ovulation. Ovulation is the secondary oocyte will bulge out through the surface of the ovary here and the egg will be released. Secondary oocyte bulges out against the surface of the ovary and then is ejected, kicked out. Women can also often feel cramps during ovulation. That the pain, that's painful when the egg busts out of the surface of the ovary. A lot of women can have cramps in the middle of the month. 
This egg is ejected into the fallopian tubes. I didn't draw them. I didn't want to complicate the picture, but the egg is released into the fallopian tubes. And it takes a few days. It flows through the fallopian tubes. We go back to the picture here. Egg is released here. It takes a couple days to flow through the fallopian tubes. And if the woman has intercourse between the time she ovulates and the end of the cycle, she could get pregnant. She always, no, but could certainly get pregnant because sperm will come up through the vagina and can swim right up in there and, oh, and hanging out right here, an egg comes and potentially fertilization and baby, okay? Now, the interesting thing that happens is meiosis 2 will only happen if the egg is fertilized. So again, here was birth where everything quit and stopped. Meiosis continues. We're now in puberty. Here's our secondary oocyte right here, which is right here. Let's say it busts out of the ovaries and now it's in the uterus, fallopian tubes to uterus. Here comes a sperm. Now, what's going to happen? If the egg and sperm fertilize, only then will meiosis II happen. Very important to remember, meiosis II will only happen in a woman if there is fertilization. Once the sperm and egg meet, then meiosis II Again, we have some throwaway material, a polar body, just like here, throwaway material, but the other is you, your baby, actually, your baby. And there's your zygote. Here's a picture. So here's your secondary oocyte. You see it? It's kind of busting out of the surface. Here's the egg that got released. But what's this here? Well, an interesting thing happens. The follicle, the space where the egg was after the egg is released, becomes the corpus luteum. Corpus luteum. And this structure continues to release estrogen. Continues to release estrogen for a number of days, 10 days or something like that, if the egg that was released is not fertilized, then eventually the corpus luteum will scrunch up and dry up, estrogen levels fall, and we have a period. The lining of the uterus will shed itself. So here, endometrium, the lining of uterus, is developing. The egg will mature. The egg is released. It's in the uterus, hanging out, waiting for some sperm. Uterus is all ready. No, no baby? Okay, then the endometrium, just the lining of the uterus, is the blood that we have in menstruation. And it does it all again the following month for 40 years plus. <laughs> anyway, there you have it, Reproductive System. Mr. Anderson has a nice video if you'd like to check him out. And of course, this video will be attached. There you have it, Human Physiology. We learned a lot about it. If you're in a major where you have to take Bio 281, Human Physiology, on each of the subjects we went through, you will go into greater detail. Good stuff. It's so fun. I could eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I hope you liked it as much as I did. We'll see you next time. Have a good day.